I want to I wanna, uh, conclude our look at Matthew 26, 31 through 46 this morning. This is a fundamentally important passage. It's a passage that, that will ring in our ears one day. When we are in the presence of Christ at the judgment, we will say, there will be a sense of deja vu. We'll say, we've heard this before. Jesus is going to separate all mankind, all the nations, so it's all mankind, to his right, to his right, or to his left. And the sheep will be on his right, the goats on his left. As a shepherd separates sheep and goats, but actually he does say the sheep are on his right, and so he's referring to those who are loved as sheep and those who are rejected as goats. And and the 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 explanation he gives of his judgment is an explanation that we all really very, very, very much need to take to heart, hear and take to heart what is said in these verses. So stand with me, 31 through 46, Matthew 25. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne... And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom which has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Then the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. He will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger, or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, To the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Raise your arms with me and ask God to bless his word. Father, we pray that you will bless the reading and the speaking on your word. May my words be acceptable in your sight. My meditations be pleasing to you, Father, and may you grant your word the power to convict first me and then everyone in here, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> you may be seated. <coughs> this is the culminating warning of a series of warnings delivered by Jesus to his disciples. From here on, it's action with Jesus, at least in Matthew. And John gives us a little further teaching. But from here on, it's action. It's the actual work of Christ atoning for our sins. It is the work that he came to earth to do, and it is being accomplished for the rest of of Matthew. So this is the last sort of didactic, pedagogical, whatever you want to call it, formal teaching that Matthew relates. And thus it's important, vital. The Holy Spirit inspires Matthew to end the teaching segment with this. John of the of the four gospels has teaching that he relates from the the night that Jesus has betrayed the last supper <clears throat> Matthew Mark Luke this is about it the holy spirit considers this enough <coughs> all this everything that Matthew writes here is predicated on Jesus and what what is following what he came to do There is a return of the Son of Man in glory. All the angels with him, all the nations will be gathered. He will judge. 
The Father has given all judgment to him. He will judge. And at the end, he will send some away to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. He has come to purchase many children for the Father. His goal is to bring you with him to eternal life. That's his desire. That is his purpose in coming to earth. That is the reason that he died. He died to satisfy the justice of God at the sin of man. Only his death was sufficient to cover the gravity of even one sin, let alone all the sins of all mankind. But in him was such overwhelming perfection and glory and worth that his death could atone for every sin that you and I and everyone on earth has committed. Jesus dies as our substitute. <clears throat> and in these verses, he warns us to take seriously what he came to do and the, the, the implications of what he came to do for your life and for mine. Now, this scene that is related to us by the primary actor in the scene, Jesus is telling us what he's going to do, and there's no doubt that he's going to do it. This scene is one of the sharpest, most caustic in some ways and reassuring in other ways of all the scenes in Scripture. The, the notion of rejection is powerful here. The reality of rejection. Rejection is something we all hate. <clears throat> if you were a hemophiliac like me, you hated getting in line for the baseball team, but because you couldn't play baseball and weren't allowed to take risks, you know, you were the last one chosen for the team. Yeah, I, I, that kind of rejection you remember all your life. You remember the girl that, how many of you were, had a girl say no to you when you asked her out? And now, 30 years later, you still remember it as sharply as you did that day, right? Am I right? You know? Rejection is a powerful thing. Rejection is powerful whether it's warranted or not. Some rejections are warranted. Some are not. But Christ here is making very clear that there's coming a time when many, many, many men and women will be rejected. The most powerful, pivotal rejection the world has ever known or will ever know. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit saying, we're done with you. Go for eternity to the place where I would have saved you from. It's not a rejection like the cool kids rejecting the uncool kids. It's a rejection of one who has done everything possible to save you. And you have turned your back on it. Finally, him saying, okay, you have chosen your path. You have determined your future. Now, go. No lack of desire in Christ for you to come to him. No lack of willingness to have you. But he is going to at some point say, be gone to many people. <clears throat> now, it's, it should be clear to us that that the cause of our rejection will be our attitude towards Jesus. In particular, our attitude towards his death on the cross. What is your attitude towards Jesus dying on the cross? What does that mean to you? How has that had impact on your life? Where is there evidence that you have come to know Jesus as your atoning sacrifice, the Lamb of God who died to take away not just the sins of the whole world, but the sins of you. Where is this in your life? If you have read the Old Testament recently, as I've been doing, and you get to the book of Leviticus, <laughs> Exodus and Leviticus, you know that atonement is everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Jewish life was filled with sacrifices of atonement. You atoned for this and that and the other. Atonement 
was a daily ritual in Israel. There was the yearly sacrifice of atonement where the scapegoat is taken out, where the one goat is sacrificed, where the blood is poured, and the priest goes into the inner sanctum, the holy of holies, and pours blood on the, the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant inside the mercy seat. A great ritual of atonement, the highlight of the year of, of atonement. <laughs> and that, <coughs> that mercy seat, that Ark, Year after year, having the blood of goats poured over it. It was made of gold, but after a century, and it was around for many, many centuries. After a century, I, I suspect you couldn't see a single, a single speck of gold because of all the blood that was poured on it. A signal of the need for atonement. You made atonement for sin, for, for sin that you committed knowingly, <coughs> for sin that you committed unknowingly for inadvertent sin you made atonement for leprosy <coughs> you made atonement for prolonged menstruation you made atonement for your house if it got mold if you're a male and have a nocturnal emission you made atonement on and on and on and these are just the lesser acts of atonement you were constantly remembering your sin because you were constantly, if you were an observant Jew, making atonement, going to the temple and offering a sacrifice to God. <coughs> now, we think that the Jews of that day were stupid. We kind of look at them and say, how could you be like that? How could you think that way in many areas? How could you, how could you resent being taken out of Egypt? How could you resent having the, the manna given you? We all look at the Jews and say, how could you? And yet, the reality is we're doing exactly the same thing time after time. The Jews weren't stupid. They understood that mold on a house did not equal, in the eyes of God, murder or adultery. You think they didn't know that? They knew that. They knew that prolonged menstruation was a medical condition. And they understood that by making atonement for it, they weren't doing the same thing when they did the scapegoat and put the blood on the altar. They understood <clears throat> that for real sin, real sin, a violation of God's law, the death of an animal was not sufficient. They understood it. God had said to them, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord. Thank you, brother. Ah, yeah. I'm at that stage in life where people have to give me water, so I stay. <laughs> but I am appreciative because... I've been having a bloody nose all morning. That's something that happens when you have hemophilia, right? Uh, they understood that for real sin, the death of an animal was not sufficient, that the death of an animal could not take away adultery. You know, you're going to go and kill a goat, and that's going to take away your betrayal of your wife? Really? I mean, what man in his right mind would say to his wife after she's discovered him having committed adultery, oh, I'm sorry, honey. I'm going to make it all right. I'm going to go take the family dog, and I'm going to sacrifice it. Can you imagine that? Can you think that your wife would be satisfied that you went and took the family dog or the, you know, a, a barnyard animal? Because you committed adultery? They're not stupid. They understand that God is no more satisfied by a goat or a lamb than their wife would be by a goat and a lamb if they committed adultery. And God, if it weren't simply a matter, matter of, of logic, God had said to them, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? <coughs> I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the, bull, the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. He says, I'm so sick of your sacrifices that he who kills an ox is like one who slays a man. In other words, 
you're killing an ox to me is no better in my eyes than you're killing a man. He who sacrifices a lamb is like one who breaks a dog's neck. Little statement about the, the, the God's view of someone who, who breaks a dog's neck. Mistreatment of animals. He who offers a grain offering is like one who offers swine's blood. Putting swine's blood on the altar of God. He who burns incense is like the one who blesses an idol. God has said this all throughout the Old Testament. <clears throat> and so when the people look at their life of atonement, the series of atonements that they must make, they face one of two choices in understanding that system of atonement, the sacrificial system and the laws that governed all the situations demanding a sacrifice of atonement. They could look at it as a concrete system of atonement that somehow offering that lamb for their adultery actually takes away their sin. Now, they're not going to make the mistake, as God had said over and over again, look, these things don't really satisfy me. The lambs, the bulls, the goats, your sacrifices, your grain offerings, they don't satisfy me. So they didn't look at it as though their actual performance of the killing satisfied God. But what they understood was that God had established a pattern, a mechanism for them to achieve atonement, and that if they followed his law, it wasn't the animal, it was their obedience, if they followed his law and did the sacrifices and atoned for all the things that they had atoned for, they would jump through the hoop that God had set up, they would please him, and thus his, sa his wrath was satisfied. That the whole system, not just the animals, the whole system was a way of working off actual sin. That is the attitude of the Jews of this day. And it is the attitude of most of you, at least at some point or another in your life. That doing the work and following the prescribed series of, of actions is what pleases God. Or they could look at the entire system as it was representative of a deeper truth. They could understand by faith that the demands on God's people of God's holiness are immense, all-encompassing, and that the sin of our lives is everywhere and all the time, and that no series of hoops jumped through is ever going to atone for the consistent sin of our lives. And they could recognize that the sacrifices and the animals put to death pointed to a better sacrifice, a lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. So they could look to their own obedience and their own fulfilling of the law, or they could look to a greater sacrifice. What is apparent in Christ's teaching in this passage is that there are three distinctions in his judgment on the sheep and the goats, three differences between these classes that tie to their understanding of Christ and his atonement. First, it is absolutely clear from what Jesus says that God's people are chosen. They are set apart radically to be holy. They are distinct from everyone else. This is the entire message of cleansing and purity. At the end of Leviticus, God says, these are my rules because you are a people set apart to me and you are to be holy. And so you have things ranging from don't have sex with an animal, don't have sex with another, another man, don't have sex with your father's sister, and you have things like don't mix together flax and wool. Don't eat something that doesn't have both a cloven wolf and that chews the cud. Some of those sound to you really strong and obvious, and others sound to you foreign and, huh? But God is saying to the Jews, in every way in life, you are different. In every way, you're set apart from the way you clothe yourself to the circumcision of your bodies to the sacrifices you give, you're different. You're supposed to be visibly different. Different in a way that makes you my people. 
Here, Jesus turns the attention of his disciples who he's warning that they not take for granted their salvation. He turns them to his, to his atoning death. He reminds them that in heaven, those who will be welcomed there are chosen people, and they must have lived as such. So we must take seriously what Jesus says initially to the two classes of people that are before him at the judgment, the goats and the sheep. At the outset, Jesus will divide all mankind into two different groups. At the outset of the judgment, right at the very beginning. Sheep on his right, goats on his left. And having separated mankind in this way, he issues judgment. Beginning with those on his right, to whom he says, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom which has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now note what Jesus says here. He says three things. They are blessed of his Father. They are heirs of the kingdom. And as a result, they receive as their inheritance a kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. Notice the blessing of the Father, the kingdom they receive. These things were prepared and designated for them before the foundation of the world. Before the very first day of creation, this blessing was prepared for that group on Christ's right. They are chosen. What else does scripture say was accomplished before the foundation of the world? Revelation 13, 8. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, Christ, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation. I'm sorry, Christ. The Antichrist. Whose names are not written in the the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If their names are not written in the book of of life of the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world, then they worship the Antichrist. Jesus, the Lamb of God, was crucified from the very day that God planned mankind in the world. It was no mistake. The sin in the garden was foreseen. The course of mankind was known. And Jesus died. He was crucified from the foundation of the world. Before the world came into being, the atonement of Christ for our sins and his substitution for us under the wrath of God was already a sealed deal, a done deal, an accomplished fact. Paul writes in Ephesians 1, 3 through 8, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Every sheep at Christ's right hand was chosen by God, and that before the foundation of the world. Every part of the plan of redemption was set in place by God before man was created. Jesus appointed the Lamb of God to die for the sins of man before Adam sinned. The names of God's chosen people written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And this is not told us to make you fear. Nor is it told you to make you think, well, I'm excluded. This is just heavenly reality. God chooses man. Jesus says to his disciples, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you to bear fruit. And so I I call you to understand that God has chosen certain people now. This, of course, engenders fear in people at times, and they go, well, what if I'm not chosen? What if I'm not in that group? The purpose of this fact that's established in Scripture and repeated over and over again is not to cast you out. 
not to make you feel hopeless, but to make you understand that God has been thinking about you from the beginning of creation. No one knows whose names are in that book. Only God alone. No one knows whose name is in that book. Do I know that my name is in that book? Do you know? Do you know? Have you seen the book of the, of the Lamb, the book of life? Have you seen your name? It's opened in heaven. We don't know. But the purpose of this statement that God has blessed you from the foundation of the world, that Christ died for you from the foundation of the world, is to give you hope that God is not going to be foiled in his work in your life. It's to make you understand that God has power and what he sets out to do before the foundation of the world, he will accomplish. And you say, well, maybe I'm not in that book. Well, maybe I'm not too. But we'll learn as we follow the directions of Christ. We'll see. That's why Jesus gives us this whole chapter, this whole statement of his judgment. So that we'll know and have hope. <clears throat> My father told me years ago about, um, I think it was a reformed, I, I, I can't remember who it was. My brother would probably remember. And I didn't have time to call him. <laughs> but a, a famous reformed theologian who was teaching, and I think it may have been B.B. Warfield at Princeton, some of you have heard of him. You can't get more Calvinist than B.B. Warfield. But he was asked in a class by a student, what if on the judgment someone says, I wanted you, Jesus. Will he look in his book and say, oh, no, your name is not here? He said something that's scandalous. But what he said is, God is enough of a gentleman that if you say, I want in, he'll open his doors for you. Now, I know that doesn't sound Calvinist to you, does it? But this is the reality. You don't know whose name is in that book. What God has said to you is ask, seek, pursue. And the gates of heaven will be open to you. It's not a statement that you're rejected. It's a statement from God saying, come after me. Seek it from me. Ask for my son. This difference between the two groups is explicitly clear in their reaction to the judgment of Christ. There's a group that says, well, we should be allowed in. And there's a group that says, ah, we didn't deserve anything. We didn't do anything. Isn't it interesting that the group that says, we jumped through the hoops is not the one that's accepted, but the group that says, we did nothing is the group that is accepted. Doesn't that grab you? And it's a warning as well. Because we always are thinking, I've done a pretty good job. And the Bible's always saying to us, you've not been righteous. You need to look to Jesus. And so not only are they distinct in, their, in the matter of their being chosen by God, they're being blessed before the foundation of the world, these two groups are different in their faith. The one group says, ah, Christ, can you imagine standing before Jesus? And he says, come here, enter Enter into my Father's glory. Enter into the, my joy. <clears throat> and you're standing there and you say, we've done nothing. And he says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me. And I was in prison and you visited me. I was naked and you clothed me. And you're on this side and you go, and this is the response of these people. They go, we didn't do anything. We didn't do anything. No, Jesus. We did nothing. You did it all. And we're not even going to claim anything. We did nothing. 
And that is faith in Jesus. We did nothing. Jesus, you did it all. On the other side, Jesus says, I was hungry, thirsty, I was in prison, I was naked, I was sick, and you didn't help me. What did they say? Lord, when did we see you and not do it? It's a statement of righteousness. We've done what you expected. We jumped through the hoops you put in front of us. We deserve to get in. The third difference, the second is faith. The first one is God's choice. The second is a very different faith. The one has faith in Jesus. The other has faith in themselves. The third difference between these two groups is this. There's a different love. They all share an understanding of the retributive nature of divine justice. No one on this day of judgment could view the sacrificial system and see it as anything other than an expression of true justice, God's justice. But the one group views their practice of the sacrificial system as enough to atone for their sins. The other looks at Jesus and says, this is the Lamb of God who died for me. This is my Savior. I love him. And out of that love for this Savior who died for me, this group says, I'm going to do things for people. I love God. I'm undeserving. I'm going to live for other people. And they do good works. Not good works to merit God's pleasure. Good works because they've experienced the pleasure of God. They know the Son of God. They know the grace of God. They know that as he went to the cross, he told them, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. <clears throat> Jesus commands that you love. And on the day of judgment, we must recognize that what he's going to say is not, oh, your name's in my father's book that will be evident all right that will come out at some point nor does he say on that day oh my you believed in me no on that day everyone believes on him right there's no one on that day who doesn't believe in Jesus in the way that demons do at least which is that he is the son of God and that he was sent as a sacrifice for man's sins so they'll be united in that but there will be a remaining distinction and that is a love the one group is going to be said, you showed love, you did things that were consistent with your faith in me, you loved other people, and I welcome you in. Jesus has said that you must love your brothers, that the sign that we are belonging to him, that the world will know us by, is our love, not our intellectual knowledge of him, not our performance of many duties, but that we love one another. This is inescapable, fundamental, and we can't get around it. Now, I know that we're going to be um, <coughs> questioning and saying, <laughs> some of you at least will likely say, well, certainly those works that they've done, the good things they did, are not the reason they get into heaven. <sighs> And I, I say, well, what does Jesus say here? Okay. He says, you who are beloved of my Father, you who are called from before, blessed before the foundation of the world. He says these things. And he says, and you cared for other people. Are we going to say to Jesus, you're wrong? You don't understand the place of faith? Jesus, you got it wrong. But how often does Jesus say, obey me, obey me, obey me? Never having our obedience substitute for his death. Never presenting our obedience as atoning for our sin. But if you think you can separate obedience from God from faith in God, you don't understand faith and you don't understand obedience. Faith and obedience are linked. You can't have the one without the other. So I close by talking to you and saying, some of you don't know that you know God and you're scared and you're afraid that he may have not chosen you and you stand here or sit here this morning as someone who is not part of us really at least in your mind you don't think you are and it may be that you're not part of us 
it may well be that you're among that group that would, if you continue on this path, be rejected by Jesus. What can you do? Well, honestly, I'm going to say to you what I know from my own childhood, which is that most of you probably do believe that Jesus was the Son of God, even if you're in this category I'm talking about. You do believe that Jesus was the Son of God. You believe that he died. You believe that he rose again. Those are all things that the demons believe, right? You believe that you need to give your heart to him. You may have even prayed to Jesus and said, Jesus, take my heart. But you haven't felt union with him. You haven't felt the Holy Spirit's power. You haven't known what it is to to be born again. You have head knowledge. You have certain practices. You've done the things you've been told that you should do by your parents and Sunday school teachers and pastors. But you don't know it. So what is left for you to do? Have you plumbed the depths of what God has available for you and just found it wanting? You know? You prayed. You read the Bible. You're attending church. You're doing the right things. You believe in Jesus. But you know that there's something missing. And this is not an unusual situation in churches. This is not an uncommon situation. So what do you do? Well, I'll tell you what to do. It's what changed my life. You read the Bible as someone who really believes that Jesus meant something when he spoke it. You read the Bible and you you come across passages like I did when I came across 1 John 1, 9, 30 some years ago, almost 40. And I saw it say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. And I thought to myself, wow, I'm so sick of my sin. It had been years of sin and slight victories, but I just saw a mountain of sin and no hope. And I thought, I wonder if this verse says God will help me defeat sin if I go out and confess it. And I've told you many times, I went out into the Alaskan countryside that summer and I walked every night and I confessed my sins. And in two weeks, I was a new man. And I knew it and everyone there that summer knew I was a new man. Because I obeyed. Because I didn't just go on the dead knowledge. Because I started actually doing what the Bible said to do. You've come to the bottom, you think, of God's God's powers and blessings for you. And you've not found it fulfilling. And you're saying, God, my name must not be in your book. Because I've tried all these things. You know, I've prayed, I've read them, I believe. Let me just say to you, practice repentance. Just go to God and name your sins to him. Do what the Bible says to do. Do what Jesus has said. Do what John the Baptist says. Bear fruit in accord with repentance. Start obeying Jesus. Take just one thing that you find that he said that you're going to obey him on and see what he does as you start to obey him. See how he comes in with the Holy Spirit's power and changes you, not as you mentally acknowledge him, but as you physically, spiritually start to embrace what he's told you to do. I'm telling you, you haven't plumbed the depths of what God has available to you until you obey Jesus. And until you obey him, it's going to be theoretical, it's going to be distant, but once obedience enters your life, It's going to be rich. Let's pray.